Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Planning officer, yesterday the Education Secretary said that cuts to teacher training places five years ago probably went too far. Opposition parties could have told his predecessor that at the time, and in fact we did. So will the First Minister admit that when it comes to the basic task of putting enough teachers into our classrooms, her government got it wrong? First Minister. No. As those who were in Parliament at the time back in, I think it was 2010 and 11 will recall, at that time we had a significant issue of teacher unemployment. It was thought at that time that we had a surplus of teachers coming out of the system and many of them were uh, struggling to get jobs. That's why we took the action we did. But of course, every single year since then, every uh, one of the six years since then, we have seen an increase in the numbers of students going into uh, teacher education. And in fact, in this year, uh, we're seeing an increase in teacher training numbers of 371. We're also uh, having a campaign to uh, recruit teachers targeting particularly the STEM subjects that is building on the work that was done last year that helped drive a 19% <coughs> increase in the intake of student teachers. Uh, and of course, we saw an increase in the number of teachers working in our schools in the past years and this government is investing more than £80 million to maintain the teacher uh, numbers in our schools and to maintain the pupil-teacher ratio. So as I've recognised in this chamber previously, we've got work to do, but we are taking the actions that are making sure we've got the right numbers of teachers in our schools, getting on with that important job of improving standards and closing the attainment gap. Ruth Davison. Once again, we've got a First Minister asking for applause for promising to fix a mess that her government made. It's quite simple, presiding officer, that the SNP government didn't listen. They didn't listen to warnings from this chamber and they didn't listen to student leaders who called for an end to boom and bust method towards teacher training. First, they brought on too many trainees with the consequence that they ended up in the dole queue and not in the classrooms. And then they cut the numbers too drastically with the consequence that we no longer have enough teachers. 4,000 fewer than when this government came to office. So does it sound like the record of a competent government to this First Minister? First Minister. Well, I tell you who we didn't listen to back in 2010. We didn't listen to the Tories because here's what the Tories had to say about uh, the issue, as uh, Liz Smith described it at the time, the issue of demand and supply. What she said at the Education Committee at the time is given all the difficulties and the current economic situation, it might be necessary to re-examine teachers' conditions. So that's what the Tories wanted us to do. They wanted us to slash teachers' pay and conditions. Now, as I've said, and this is an important issue, and those who were in Parliament at the time will remember uh, previous First Minister's question sessions talking about the very important issue of teacher unemployment. We inherited a figure around teacher training that was considered at that time to be, to be leading to an oversupply of teachers. That's why we took corrective action at that time to deal with that issue. But every single one of the six years since then, we have made sure we have had appropriate numbers of teachers coming into teacher training. As I said, in this year, we are supporting an additional 371 uh, going into teacher training. We have more teachers in our schools, as we saw in the most recent figures published in December of last year, uh, than was the case the previous year. And we are investing uh, into local authorities more than £80 million to make sure we maintain the number of teachers and of course teachers uh, are there to make sure that they are raising standards and closing the attainment gap uh, and one of the most important things uh, to use the words of a teacher that I spoke to in Eastern Bartonshire on Saturday uh, what one of the life-changing things that he thinks we are doing is putting more money into the hands of teachers directly more money into the hands of head teachers so that they can take the steps to raise standards and close the attainment gap. So I, uh, again, will be absolutely frank with this chamber and with the people of Scotland. We have challenges uh, to confront and we are confronting them, but we are pressing on with the programme of reform in education to make sure that we address each and every one of them. Ruth Davidson. So yesterday, John Swinney says we did get it wrong. Today, the First Minister stands up and says it's everybody else's fault. And the line on education from this First Minister seems to be, forget about 10 years of failure, 
Forget about the mess they've made. Forget about the children who've been failed by her government. She's the person to sort this out. Well, if she's going to do that, she first has to admit the consequences of getting it wrong. She needs to admit that her government's disastrous workforce planning and what it means right now, that we don't have enough teachers for STEM subjects, we don't have enough teachers for additional support needs, that schools are being forced to limit which subjects pupils are able to take because they don't have enough teachers to do the job. If she is going to fix this, will she first admit what needs fixed? First Minister. Please. Ruth Davidson talks, uh, I think rightly, about the importance of workforce planning. The decision uh, that she is criticising, taken in one year in 2010, was actually based on the unanimous advice of the Teacher Workforce Planning Group, a group that includes councils, teaching unions and the universities. But I also think, you know, Ruth Davidson wants me uh, to take responsibility. In every single year since then, what we have done as a government is ensure an increasing number of young people going into teacher training. Uh, so we acted to deal with an issue that was there at the time and was the subject of much discussion in this chamber, but then we recognised we had to increase in the years after that. That's why for every one of the last six years, we have increased the numbers going into teacher training. And we're taking a range of other actions as well, <clears throat> from the National Improvement Framework to the Attainment Challenge, to the Attainment Fund and the Pupil Equity Fund, getting resources into the hands of teachers, uh, the increased number of teachers uh, that this year are in our schools compared to the previous year. So you know, I, I take responsibility for everything this government does, but I, I am also absolutely determined to get on with the job of improving standards in our schools. And the last point I would make to Ruth Davidson is this one. While I take absolute responsibility for everything this government does, what we need to make sure uh, over the next seven days is that we don't end up with another Westminster government that is taking action and making cuts that are likely to push that are likely to push an additional one million children across the UK into poverty. Because it's not going to help anybody raise standards in our schools if we've got a Westminster government pushing those children into conditions of poverty. Ruth Davidson. I take responsibility, but it's everyone else's fault. Yeah. Earlier this week, presiding officer, earlier this week, we set out our interim reports into the curriculum for excellence. And one of the numerous recommendations was to ensure the proper teaching of core skills after we've seen standards of literacy, numeracy and science drop under this government. Now, I noticed that John Mason has an education question in a few moments' time. Now, this is the same John Mason who has, in a litany of tweets this week, said that we have moved on from spelling and times tables, that if someone has only basic literacy, they should concentrate on what they're good at, that you don't need spelling to be a surgeon, you don't need grammar to work in IT, an engineer doesn't need high levels of English, and that there was too much emphasis on, and I'll directly quote, the academic in the past. So can I ask, is this the view of the SNP government? Because if it is, it explains why standards are so poor. First Minister. Hi. I had, a, I had a look at the publication the Tories published earlier this week and actually much of it is work that this government is already doing in our schools. They should maybe pay more attention. But getting back to the serious point of standards of literacy, it's because the highest standards of literacy are so vital for every single young person uh, across our country that we are taking the action that we are taking. It's why we now have new Curriculum for Excellence uh, benchmarks in place. It's why we have established the Attainment Fund, directing resources to head teachers to allow them to take the action they think is necessary to improve standards. It's why uh, we have uh, put in place arrangements to make sure that in future we will have comprehensive data, school by school, local authority by local authority, telling us how our schools are performing in these basic skills of literacy and numeracy. It's why we've got initiatives like the Reading Challenge, encouraging young people to read for pleasure. So standards of literacy are vitally important as a foundation for everything else our young people do. And that is why we will get on with the job of building on the progress 
we have made in our education system, building on the hard work done by teachers and pupils across this country. And it is why, unlike the Conservatives in Westminster, we will increase, we'll increase the budgets going to our schools while they continue to cut them. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Uh, engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. The SNP's treatment time guarantee gives patients a 12-week legal guarantee for treatments such as knee replacements and eye surgery. Can the First Minister tell us how many people waited longer than 12 weeks in the last year? First Minister. Uh, we have a situation in our NHS, like many health services have, of increasing demand, and we are seeing more patients wait longer than we would want them to wait, including uh, for the treatment time guarantee of 12 weeks. But over 1.3 million inpatients uh, and day case patients have benefited from that 12-week uh, treatment target since it was first introduced, with 946 of all patients, as that was introduced, being treated within 12 weeks. Uh, what we saw in the figures published this week is as a result of the £10 million investment made uh, by the Health Secretary last November, we have seen a 20% reduction in outpatients uh, waiting for treatment. Uh, and of course, the Health Secretary announced £50 million of additional investment on Tuesday of this week to make sure we can see those continued improvements in inpatient waiting times as well. There wasn't an answer in any of that, so let me give the First Minister the answer. In the last year alone, more than 38,000 patients waited longer than 12 weeks. And we've just heard the First Minister tell the Chamber that people across Scotland have benefited from the legal guarantee. But Labour can reveal today that patients actually had a better chance of being treated within 12 weeks before the SNP introduced the legal guarantee. And that should shame the First Minister, because behind these numbers are people and real lives. It's pensioners, it's children and parents waiting for months for operations. But this isn't the only problem facing the NHS. This week alone, we've seen A&E targets missed again. Cancer diagnostic waiting times missed again. The BMA told us staff shortages are the reason for falling standards in our hospitals and cancer research said patients are waiting too long, all growing evidence of the SNP's 10-year mismanagement of the NHS. So when will the First Minister focus on the day job and start fixing the mess she's made of our NHS? First Minister. Well, I, I acknowledge the challenges facing our NHS. Uh, the same challenges that are facing health services across the world, uh, increasing demand because of the changing demographics. But I also uh, you know, have to say that in so many uh, ways, looking at so many indicators, the performance of the NHS in Scotland far outstrips the performance of the NHS in any other part of the UK. And in particular, in particular, on almost every indicator you can look at, the performance of NHS Scotland outstrips the performance of the NHS in Labour-run Wales. And you take accident, take accident and emergency. For 25, 25 consecutive months, any departments in Scotland have been the best performing anywhere in the UK, but no recognition from anybody in the opposition of the hard work of our a &E staff that deliver that performance. We've also seen, we've also seen, we've also seen under the SNP staffing in the NHS increasing by over 12,000. We've seen the budget for the National Health Service increased by £3 billion. Our plans to increase it further over this Parliament goes way beyond what any other party in this chamber pledged to do at the election last year and goes way beyond what any other party is pledging to do at this election this year. We've got more doctors, nurses, other health professionals per head of population than any other part of the UK. So I will acknowledge readily the pressures that our NHS staff work under and thank them for what they do. But I think occasionally, just once in a while, the opposition parties should also recognise the good work that's been done in our NHS and the fact that it's doing so much better than other parts of the UK. 
Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, that answer was so revealing. Because when the First Minister is faced with her own 10-year dismal record, all she's got in the tank is a kick at the Labour Party and an attempt to suggest we're talking down the staff. And we know the First Minister doesn't like it when people speak the truth about her record on the NHS. Just ask the nurse who had the courage to expose what life is like under the SNP. Because here's the reality. Standards in our hospitals are down. NHS staff are overworked and underpaid and tens of thousands of people are waiting longer for treatment. Isn't that what happens when the SNP spends more time running a campaign for a referendum than it does running our NHS? First Minister. I suppose we should have a competition in First Minister's questions about who's the first one to get the referendum word in because most weeks it isn't me that mentions it. Look, if that... If that... If that is Labour's attack, then how does Labour explain that on almost every indicator you can point to, the NHS in Scotland under an SNP government is doing significantly better than the NHS in Wales under a Labour government. What's Labour's excuse? Well, let me just point to the action we've taken on the NHS, staffing up by 12,000, qualified nurses and midwives eh, up by 7%, doctors up by 30%, consultants up by 45%, investing more money than any other party would have done and making sure we are delivering for patients across the country. So we'll continue, whether it's on education or on health, we'll continue to focus on delivering for people across this country and leave the opposition to their constitutional obsessions. We have a number of constitu constituency questions. The first one from Alison Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure the First Minister and all members will wish to send our most sincere sympathy to the family and friends of the young cyclist who tragically lost her life on Princess Street yesterday. Can I ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to aid the inquiry into this devastating accident and whether the First Minister and her Transport Minister will meet with the many groups and individuals who have been calling for safe conditions for cyclists and pedestrians in Edinburgh and across Scotland for many years to ensure that no other family has to bear such an appalling loss? Thank you. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, convey my heartfelt sympathies to the family and friends of the cyclist who so tragically lost their life in Edinburgh yesterday. It is a, a tragic uh, incident um, and a, an incident that is sad uh, almost beyond uh, words. Obviously, uh, as uh, the member will understand, uh, I will not go into uh, any detail about the particular incident because there are uh, and will continue to be investigations into that. The Scottish Government will assist with that in any uh, way we possibly can. Uh, as the member is aware, we've taken uh, a number of actions, including increased investment over uh, the years to encourage more people to cycle and to make cycling as safe as possible for people. But in uh, direct answer to uh, the question, yes, uh, the relevant minister would be willing uh, to meet with cycling groups, not just in Edinburgh, but across the country, to look at what further action we can take to make sure cycling, uh, which is an activity we want to encourage, is as safe as it possibly can be for everybody who partakes in it. Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Kyle Gunn from Johnson applied for an HND in practical journalism at Glasgow Clyde College, where he has been studying for a national qualification in media and communications. Kyle has cerebral palsy, which means he cannot write in shorthand. The SQA have told him that this means he cannot progress to an HND, as he would not be able to complete the shorthand component of the course, essentially penalising him because of his disability. Does the First Minister agree that this is unacceptable and will the First Minister look into this matter? First Minister. I'm very happy to look into this. Um, obviously, I don't know Kyle, but on the uh, short... Uh, from the short question there, he sounds like a remarkable young man who should be supported as much as possible to uh, achieve the dreams he has. Obviously, I don't know the full circumstances, so it would be wrong for me to try to uh, say any more about it just now. But of course, I will uh, have the matter looked into and uh, return to the member in writing once I've had the opportunity to do so. And Jackie Bailey. 
The First Minister will be aware of continuing concerns about the Vale of Leven Hospital. There's a maternity review, an out-of-hours service review, a review of emergency admission points such as the Medical Assessment Unit. Can I ask the First Minister to join with me in welcoming Hospital Watch to the Chamber today? They're here to present an unusual petition, a bedsheet with thousands of signatures following a 24-hour vigil at the hospital. I understand that no one from the government is available to meet with them today, so will she agree to a future meeting with them to discuss the importance of the Vale of Leven Hospital to my local community. First Minister. Well, uh, yes, I am very happy to welcome Hospital Watch uh, to the Chamber and congratulate them in their uh, innovative uh, way of submitting uh, a petition which we would be uh, delighted to, to receive. Um, in terms of uh, the Vale of Leven, obviously an issue uh, I know well from my past ministerial responsibilities. Uh, we seek and Shona Robinson has recently sought assurances from uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board uh, about the continued provision of comprehensive hospital, community and primary care services uh, across the whole of the Clyde area, but particularly at the Vale of Leven Hospital, and that remains a priority. It's the responsibility of any health board uh, to make sure that services that are provided are provided safely, uh, and Greater Glasgow and Clyde is no exception to that in uh, respect of the Vale of Leven. But we should also remember, and it's something I'm, I'm proud of, that it was this government that ended a decade of damaging uncertainty by delivering the vision for the Vale. Uh, what we saw from a previous Labour administration was the closure of the Accident and Emergency Department back in 2002. In the years that followed that, uh, we saw a decline in inpatient and day case activity at the Vale of Leven Hospital. Uh, this government took uh, office in 2007. In 2009, we published the vision for the Vale document. And I can tell the Chamber today, and this is quite an important statistic, and I hope Jackie Bailey will welcome it as a campaigner for the Vale of Leven Hospital. Since we published the vision for the Vale, inpatient and day case activity has increased by almost one third at the Vale of Leven Hospital. So we ended uh, that decade of decline at the Vale of Leven, uh, and this government is determined to make sure that the Vale of Leven continues to have a very positive future delivering for patients that it serves. Question number, th question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. It matters of importance to people of Scotland. This week I met hospital campaigners in Wick. They are facing the consequences of the downgrading of the Caithness Maternity Hospital Maternity Unit. Young mothers told me about the harrowing 100-mile journey to Inverness to give birth. That part of the country feels let down by the loss of important lifeline services like this. The First Minister is under pressure on this issue. Will she finally intervene and reverse this decision? First Minister. Well, this is a very important issue, and I, I, I genuinely hope it's one that we could avoid party politics around, because the decisions that have been taken here... I, I mean this because, as, as Willie Rennie will be aware, decisions have been taken uh, here on the basis of uh, advice that has been given on the basis of patient safety. And it's really important. No politician should or could run in the face of advice that is based on patient uh, safety issues. Uh, NHS Highland are, are currently uh, undertaking a review of the clinical service model at Caithness uh, General uh, Hospital generally. But in terms of uh, midwife uh, services, I absolutely understand uh, the feelings of mothers or expectant mothers faced with long journeys. Uh, but what is absolutely the case is that we cannot uh, have a service provided at any hospital if the uh, advice is that that may not be safe. And it was following uh, the death of an infant at the maternity unit in September 2015 uh, that the board took the decision to change the operating status of the maternity unit. It is a midwife-led uh, uh, service. So I understand these feelings. Uh, we will continue to work closely with the health board uh, to make sure they've got the right services in place and to support women uh, in the interim who may be affected by uh, the different model that is there. But at all, case, all times and all steps we take, patient safety will be absolutely the paramount consideration. Will there any? I, say I take exception to what the First Minister has just said. I am raising this issue because it is an important issue and she should accept that I've got a right to ask that question. Yeah, yeah. The, the First Minister talks about safety, but what about the risk to the mothers in labour 
on that narrow A9 road for two and a half hours. A population of almost 30,000 deserves better than a 100-mile trip to get to hospital. People across the country are being let down too. When Nicola Sturgeon announced the legally binding treatment time guarantee, she said this. There will be a straightforward system of redress on the rare occasions when things go wrong. It was rare at first, that's true. Only five patients waited longer than 12 weeks. It isn't rare anymore. 13,005 patients are waiting now. Why is it that the First Minister can come up with a triple lock for independence, but not a triple lock for patients? This waiting time guarantee is not worth the paper it's written on, and 13,000 people know it. First Minister. Well, can I return firstly to the issue of, of Caithness maternity services? Because uh, let it, just for the, the record to be absolutely clear, I did not suggest that Willie Rennie did not have the right to raise this issue. I simply, I simply expressed the hope that we would be able to discuss this issue without party politics intervening because the decision to change the status of Caithness Maternity Unit was made by NHS Highland on the grounds of safety. It was informed by a review they commissioned after the tragic death of a child in September 2015. The Chief Medical Officer supports the findings of that review. The decision was never referred to ministers because it was made on the grounds of safety. Scottish ministers have never intervened in this case. So I understand the concerns that mothers and families have here, but I think more mothers and families would undoubtedly be concerned if we were standing by and allowing a service to be delivered that was putting the lives of children at risk. So we will continue to work with NHS Highland to make sure uh, that we can deliver safe services for them and support them, whatever that model uh, of care has to be at any uh, given time. And the Health Secretary would be happy to meet uh, with anybody with concerns about this in Caithness uh, at uh, this time in order to discuss this further. On the issue of the treatment uh, time guarantee, as I've said, yes, we have more patients uh, coming forward for treatment as a result of the rising demand on health services across the world. But we are also investing record sums of money to deal with that. The Health Secretary just this week announcing additional targeted investment to make sure that as we have already seen with outpatients, a reduction in the number waiting, we can see those same improvements around uh, inpatient and day case treatment. We'll go on with the work uh, of making sure that happens. And lastly, you know, I it would not, uh, unless Willie Rennie had raised it, choose to go on to uh, the issue of the Constitution from issues as important as this. But Willie Rennie's position in this election just beggars belief you know on the one hand he has and before before I uh, get criticized oh, well, well, Willie Rennie you raised it you wish for. Willie Rennie raised it but on one hand as he is entitled to do he's going around criticizing the SNP for wanting to give people in Scotland for wanting to give people in Scotland a choice over their own future at the end of the Brexit process. But on the other hand, he's going round the length and breadth of the country arguing for a second referendum on EU membership. At least Willie Rennie could be consistent for once. I know it doesn't happen often, but in future perhaps he could try a bit of consistency in this chamber. A couple of supplementaries. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what progress has been made in introducing Scottish Social Security benefits? First Minister. Uh, well, the Cabinet Secretary made uh, a statement earlier this week on uh, the next steps we will take to deliver Scotland's new Social Security system, uh, outlined that the first benefits to be delivered uh, through that new system will be uh, the increase to the carers allowance, the new best start grant and funeral expense uh, assistance. So we will see over the next uh, couple of years those benefits start to be uh, delivered through that new system. Uh, of course, we are uh, seven days away from an election where the future of social security uh, is a key issue. Uh, I'm proud to be standing on a platform of ending cuts to support for disabled and low income 
people. Uh, I think it's not surprising uh, that the Tory party want to press ahead with billions of pounds of more cuts that are driving people into poverty and widening the inequality gap. I think it's more surprising that Labour is only pledged to reverse a quarter of the further cuts to come to Social Security. So we'll continue to go on and deliver the new system, but we'll also continue to stand up across the UK for a Social Security system that has fairness and dignity at its heart. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. First Minister, yesterday's shocking report into the deaths of tagged golden eagles showed just how high the wall of silence is that surrounds some of our sporting estates in Scotland. What assurances can the First Minister give that there will be a licensing regime for driven grouse shoots? And why, given decades of support that the SSPCA have given the police in tackling animal welfare crimes, can't their role be extended to wildlife crimes? First Minister. Well, I share uh, the concerns about the report uh, on the fate of satellite tagged raptors, which does paint a disturbing picture of the illegal killing uh, of our iconic golden eagles. Um, that shows that between 2004 and 2016, around one third of tagged golden eagles have disappeared in suspicious circumstances. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary of the Environment has announced a comprehensive and robust set of measures which uh, seek to build on the action taken over recent years. The proposals that were announced, of course, yesterday send out a very strong message that we are absolutely determined that Scotland's wildlife must be for everyone to enjoy, not for criminals to destroy for their own narrow and very selfish ends. Uh, so I hope the uh, measures announced by the Cabinet Secretary yesterday uh, will be welcomed by the member and I know she'd be happy to meet with him uh, to discuss this further. Question number four, John Mason. Th order, order. John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what recent discussions the Scottish Government has had with local authority directors of education concerning the quality of newly qualified teachers. First Minister. Well, we are determined to ensure that all newly qualified teachers enter the profession feeling confident in their skills and knowledge. Uh, the Scottish Government meets with directors of education on a regular basis uh, to discuss a range of issues relating to education and further to the publication of the content analysis of initial teacher education last week, we will be discussing next steps with universities, the General Teaching Council for Scotland and local authorities. Um, as we approach the end of the 2017 exam diet, I also want to take this opportunity to thank all teachers who have been involved in preparing our young people to sit their exams. I think it is important for our teachers to know that their commitment is valued and that their contribution is vital to our young people's success at school and in the future. John Mason. Thank the First Minister for that reply. I wonder if she agrees with the comments by Maureen McKenna, who is an Executive Director of Education in Glasgow and also President of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, when she said, quote, I have been very impressed by the quality of new, newly qualified teachers coming to teach in Glasgow and, quote, our head teachers also report very positively about the quality of newly qualified teachers. And she also made the point that teacher training at college or university is just the first step in a career and that training on the job is hugely important. First Minister. Yeah, I think Maureen McKenna's uh, comments are very uh, important and, and legitimate comments. I think it is testament to our teachers uh, and, of course, it's testament to pupils that right now we've got uh, record higher and advanced higher passes. We've got more young people achieving national five qualifications and we have record numbers of young people going into work, education and training. Uh, and perhaps most significantly, we are starting to see the attainment gap, the kind of attainment gap that is seen in many countries, uh, begin to close. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean we haven't got much more to do, including on teacher education. Our own report, uh, which I referred to in my uh, first answer, found inconsistencies between courses, uh, and that is a cause for concern. Uh, but none of that, none of that changes the fact that Scotland has excellent teachers who deserve our full support. Liz Smith. Uh, First Minister, could I ask you directly whether you believe in the context of teacher training that there should be much greater emphasis on literacy and numeracy, or whether you agree with Mr. Mason when he says, and I quote, that learning times tables and spelling were much stronger in my day, but we have moved on. <laughs> First Minister. Well, the guidance that was issued last August puts primacy on literacy and numeracy. And as I said in earlier answers, uh, high standards of literacy and numeracy are essential to provide the foundation for the learning of uh, children in other subjects. Uh, the report that I've referred to that was published uh, last week uh, into initial teacher education did show a variation 
in terms of what uh, student teachers say about their learning around literacy and that's something that we want to address uh, but standards of literacy are vitally important that's why uh, as I said earlier on we've got new benchmarks in place we're putting a focus on literacy through everything the attainment challenge is doing and why we've got initiatives uh, like the reading challenge which is uh, trying to use the pleasure of reading uh, to help improve uh, literacy amongst young people as well so we'll continue to get on uh, with all of these things and as we do so I hope we have the support of people across the chamber. Joanne McAlpine. Thank you. A Glasgow University report this week notes that Tory benefit sanctions have caused more harm to the poor than any policy since the workhouse. Many hundreds of thousands sanctioned include single parents who are unable to attend interviews because of childcare, family illness or simply not having money for the bus fare. Last night, the Prime Minister failed to Ms. attend McAlpine. a very important Ms. interview. Ms. She has no excuses. What does the First Ms. Minister McAlpine. think her sanctions should be? Sorry, First Minister. First Minister. First Minister. Sorry. Sorry, First Minister. I'm sorry, the question has to be a supplementary to the question on the order paper. So we'll move on to question number five. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to provide support for people with dementia. First Minister. <laughs> well, of, of course, this is Dementia Awareness Week, and I'm pleased to say that this Government has maintained a priority focus on dementia since 2007. We have prioritised national support for staff education, training and development across all care settings, improved dementia care standards for everyone with a diagnosis of dementia, regardless of where they live, their age or the severity of their illness. And we have ensured the provision of high quality person-centred post-diagnostic support. Uh, we will publish our new dementia strategy in the coming weeks, which will set out in further detail the work uh, that we and our partners will undertake to improve support, care and treatment for people with dementia, their families and their carers uh, in the years ahead. Peter Chapman. Thank the First Minister for her answer, but as usual, to hear that answer, you would think that everything was fine. Totally out of touch as usual. So let me tell her what the real world looks like. In the North East, I'll tell you what the real world looks like. I'll tell you what the real Order. world looks like. Order. I'll tell you what the real world looks like, <laughs> folks. In the North East, the number of people diagnosed with dementia has increased by more than 44% in the last decade. However, in 2014-15, in NHS Grampian, only 23% of people diagnosed were referred for post-diagnostic support. So what will the Scottish Government do to ensure people in remote and rural areas are able to ac access the support they require? First Minister. Well, you know, here, as in so many other areas, uh, of course, Scotland, like other countries, have got more work to do. We are seeing more and more people diagnosed with dementia as the population lives longer. One of the things that Scotland is recognised for internationally, though, is our high rates of diagnosis of dementia. Because any expert you speak to, uh, and this is true of any condition, of course, but it's particularly true of dementia because of the, the nature of support that is required, the early diagnosis is essential. So we're actually leading the world in terms of getting people diagnosed early. Uh, we've got more work to do in terms of the provision of post-diagnostic support, but again, we are way ahead of most other countries when it comes to putting in place post-diagnostic services. Uh, in the next few weeks, I think later this month, in fact, we will publish our new dementia strategy, which will build on those commitments and set out what we aim to achieve in the years uh, ahead. But let me tell you something we will not be doing here in Scotland, uh, and that is imposing a dementia tax on old people. I'm proud that in Scotland for over 65s, we have free personal and nursing care for older people uh, that are eligible for nursing and personal care. That means a contribution of nearly £13,000 a year if you have to fund your own care uh, from the state. Now that doesn't take away the burden on personal resources, but it significantly reduces it. We will also not be uh, ensuring that uh, somebody's own house is part of their financial assessment if they're receiving care in their own home, something the Tories are planning to do in England. So on this, as in so many other areas, we've got work to do. But I'm proud that when it comes to a progressive approach to dementia, when it comes to a progressive approach to paying for social care, Scotland is so much further ahead than anywhere else in the UK. And next week, we've got to make sure we don't allow Tories to drag us backwards. Marie Todd. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think I know the answer, but does the First Minister agree with me that the dementia tax, which is essentially a plot to allow the financial services industry to asset strip dementia yep. sufferers, yep. has to be one of the most inhumane yep. manif manifesto pledges ever devised? First Minister. Yes. I think from a sedentary position, Ruth Davidson is trying to defend it just as Ruth Davidson defends the rape clause, another inhumane Tory policy. But not only is the dementia tax in principle wrong, what is completely beyond belief is that we have a Prime Minister who's put forward that policy who now cannot answer even the most basic questions about it. There was firstly to be no cap on the cost of care, then there's to be a cap, but nobody in the Tories can tell anybody where the level of that is going to be set, just as they can't tell anybody uh, what the means test for the winter fuel allowance is going to be, who's going to lose it, who's going to retain it. Uh, Ruth Davidson says, oh, you don't have to worry about that in Scotland, but they won't tell us how much money they'll devolve to go with the power. Are they going to devolve the budget for the winter fuel allowance now? Are they going to do, as they did with employment support, yeah. lop money off it before they do so? The Tory manifesto, uh, published a couple of weeks ago, was nothing short of an assault uh, on pensioners' benefits. The triple lock for pensions to go, the winter fuel allowance to go, and a demand dementia tax. So I think it's very clear for pensioners across Scotland, if you want to make sure Theresa May doesn't have the power to take away your benefits and your protections, make sure you've got strong MPs standing up for you. Question number six, Polly McNeill. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to help people with arthritis who are struggling to work. First Minister. In December last year, we launched a Fair Scotland for Disabled People plan, which included £3 million of funding for the Active and Independent Living Improvement Programme. That programme helps to ensure that those who develop health conditions like arthritis while in employment can find the support they need to stay in work. Uh, from April this year, we're using devolved employability powers to provide uh, Scottish employment services specifically for disabled people and people with long-term health conditions to help them find work and stay in work. We've also committed to exploring uh, new ways of integrating health, disability and employment support in Scotland to ensure that people can find their way quickly to the tailored uh, and person-centred support that they need. Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Would the First Minister agree that there is a need to recognise the scale and the impact of musculoskeletal conditions like arthritis in Scotland? It's the biggest cause of disability and pain across the country. According to Arthritis Research UK, it accounts for half of all work-related illness. And in Scotland, 800,000 people live with osteoarthritis, which is the most common form of it. Anyone who has it will tell you it's a very painful condition. There is some evidence to suggest that the use of cannabis for many sufferers can alleviate that pain. And some have called for the use of it under strict medical conditions. For example, countries such as Germany, Canada, and 24 states in the US do this already. Earlier this year, the Medicines and Healthcare Products and Regulatory Agency said that cannabinoid is safe and companies can now apply for a license. I was genuinely pleased to note that the SNP conference overwhelmingly backed it last year. Would the First Minister consider taking steps to license cannabis for medical purposes? Or would the First Minister at least commit to looking at the basis for it? First Minister. Well, um, thank you uh, to Paul McNeill for raising uh, the issue. More generally, I do agree with her in terms of arthritis and other musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, that for many people, it will be conditions like that that make it very difficult for, for them to sustain employment, which is why all of the uh, work that I spoke about in my first answer is so important to help people uh, either get or stay in employment. It's also one of the reasons why I think uh, the assault on benefits for disabled uh, people and, and other people uh, are so wrong, because often they penalise people who want to work but find it difficult to do so. And you know, one of the uh, other uh, uh, benefit changes I hope we see reversed in uh, the next couple of years is the cut to employment 
and support allowance for uh, disabled people. On the issue of cannabis, I uh, have long uh, been of the view uh, that there is a case for medicinal uh, use of cannabis. I am not in favour of the decriminalisation or legalisation of cannabis uh, generally, but uh, carefully used for uh, certain conditions, I think there is a case to be made. Um, there are two um, Issues, albeit they're related issues, there's the use of cannabis itself and obviously uh, the licensing uh, and classification of drugs is a matter reserved uh, to the UK government. There is then also the separate issue, uh, albeit related, which I think is the one Polly McNeill is raising, uh, of uh, drugs that are derived from uh, cannabis. Now, as with all drugs uh, in terms of their approval or not for use in Scotland, that is a, a decision for the Independent Scottish Medicines uh, Consortium. I'm more than happy to ask the Health Secretary to write to the member in more detail about uh, whether there are any drugs currently under consideration um, that would uh, be in that that category or not. So yes, I am sympathetic. I, I don't hold all of the, the levers around this in terms of the classification of drugs, uh, of, uh, drugs but in terms of medicines, uh, we have a recognised process in place in Scotland. Uh, and of course, it is open uh, to any manufacturer of drugs to ask for approval through that process. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Anas Sarwar. Um, was questioned by both Kezia Dugdale and Willie Rennie on the legal guarantee for treatment waiting times. And I believe on three occasions in response, the First Minister said that patient numbers seen had actually gone up. In actual fact, her own government statistics and the statistics of ISD show that patient seen has actually declined, while those waiting for treatment has actually gone up. In 2013, in 2013 335,000 patients uh, were seen and 5,000 waited over 12 weeks. In 2016, less than 310,000 patients were seen and over 30,000 patients waited longer than the 12-week treatment guarantee. Will the First Minister take this opportunity to correct the record? Thank you, Mr. Sarver, for raising it. Uh, the member is able to raise questions about accurate... All, all members have a duty to be accurate and truthful uh, in talking to the chamber, and the member can pursue these issues by putting down written questions or in debates or in further questions himself, and I'm sure that, that is not a point of order otherwise. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on now to members' business in the name of Maurice Corrie, and we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats. Thank you.